the Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Cara Gross Margolis is a pediatric gastroenterologist whose clinical subspecialty is gastrointestinal problems in children with autism. She completed her fellowship in pediatric gastroenterology at Children's Hospital of Boston Harvard Medical School in 2007 and has been in practice at Columbia since that time. Great, thank you, Denise. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And so what I'm going to focus on today um, is a definitely gastrointestinal problems in autism, but really an overarching view of the brain-gut access in autism spectrum disorders. So Denise gave you a little bit of some detail of my background, and she talked about my clinical interest, which again is GI problems or gastrointestinal problems in children with autism spectrum disorders, but I'm also a scientist, and so I do clinical and basic science research on the development of the enteric nervous system, which essentially is the nervous system or the brain in the gut. And I really focus on how neurotransmitters, and particularly serotonin, facilitates brain-gut communication and how when that becomes disrupted, as in autism spectrum disorders, it can lead to different types of brain-gut access disease. So I'm going to start this talk today with a small clinical vignette of a patient I saw a couple of years ago by the name of Matthew. And Matthew presented to me with a chief complaint of recent regression. Matthew was 17 at the time and other than a history of autism had no other medical issues. And six months prior to coming to see me, he had some he was really at his baseline. He had some verbal ability. He had good eye contact. He was an avid reader and scored off the charts in math testing. However, after a trip to India, he caught a, a gastrointestinal bug or a virus of some sort, which manifested as diarrhea for five to seven days. And while his diarrhea resolved with a course of antibiotics, his behaviors radically changed after those antibiotics. And Matthew entered an essentially catatonic state. He became completely nonverbal, he no longer made eye contact, and he stopped all his reading and math. He also developed severe obsessive compulsive behaviors, which really inhibited him from any of his normal daily activities. One of those obsessive behaviors was water drinking, and he was actually admitted to the intensive care unit twice, secondary to water intoxication. Upon further history, it became evident to me that he had a variety of symptoms or signs that were consistent with a gastrointestinal diagnosis. He was banging on his chest, he had excessive drooling, and was really constipated, and was actually even trying to self-disimpact with his own hands. So I treated him for severe constipation and gastritis, which was essentially acid reflux. And once I did this, all of these new onset behaviors resolved once his GI conditions were treated, including his obsessive compulsive disorder, as well as the catatonia. So what I hope to highlight just in this small clinical story is that individuals with autism have gastrointestinal conditions, the clinical presentations of which can be dramatically different than individuals without autism. And it's really important to understand these distinctions for both diagnosing GI problems in these individuals as well as treating them. And so what I hope to review today during this talk is really an overview of gastrointestinal conditions in autism, the prevalence, the types of gastrointestinal conditions that affect these kids, as well as how they present. And then I'll go a little bit more into what's known so far about the brain-gut links in autism spectrum disorders, with really a focus on two of my major interests, which are the intestinal microbiome and serotonin. So the history of gastrointestinal issues spans really way back to the inception of the understanding of the disorder. And this is a picture of Leo Connor, who described autism in a seminal paper. So even in that seminal paper written back in the 1940s, uh, Dr. Connor described the vast majority of the kids that he described with autism to also have, quote, feeding or dietary issues. So while this was supportive of an association between autism and gastrointestinal problems way back from the beginning of recognition of the disorder, he related all of these issues to autism type behavior rather than a distinct gastrointestinal problem. And unfortunately, this has been a theme throughout history. But what we've seen increasingly is that gastrointestinal disorders really appear to be more common in individuals with autism. And this was a nice paper written by Dan Curry, which reviewed 
all the studies looking at the prevalence of gastrointestinal conditions in individuals with autism over a 10 to 20 year period. And you can see that the variance is huge, anywhere from 90 to 91 percent. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that these studies were done very heterogeneously and often included really small sample sizes. But if you focus on the ones that have a control group, meaning that kids with autism were compared to neurotypical kids without autism, you can see that in all but one study, GI conditions were at least two to three times more common in the kids with autism compared to those without. This was confirmed in a huge study, looking back at over 14,000 individuals less than age 35, who showed once again that GI conditions were two to three times more common. And probably the best study done was published in 2014. And so it was a, called a meta-analysis, which looked at all the studies done that had a control group. So had groups comparing kids with autism to those without and looking at prevalence. And what they found by analyzing these studies altogether were that overall GI conditions are over fourfold more common in kids with autism compared to those without, with constipation and diarrhea being the most common. And in the kids that I see, and in many of these individual studies, constipation tends to be the most common. So while constipation and diarrhea tend to be the most common problem seen, these kids suffer from a variety of gastrointestinal problems that can affect any child, including gastroesophageal reflux disease or acid reflux, inflammation of the stomach or the esophagus, also called gastritis or esophagitis, irritable bowel syndrome, nutritional deficiencies, often secondary to food or texture aversions, small bowel bacterial overgrowth or dysbiosis. And there's also been a number of studies that suggest that there may actually be an increased incidence of both allergic conditions as well as inflammatory bowel disease. So amongst other reasons, one of the really key and important reasons that it's, that it's so critical to diagnose the gastrointestinal problems in these kids is because they often cause difficult behaviors and the pain intensity often correlates with behavior severity. But a chief problem in really being able to diagnose these kids is in the way they present. And the presentation is usually not abdominal pain. I put a picture here, as you see, of a girl without autism. And this is what most doctors see in their office. They see kids who are verbal and who have good sensory localization. So they can tell you they have abdominal pain and actually point to the area. This contrasts in individuals with autism who oftentimes are not verbal or purposely verbal or have poor sensory localization, and they can present with a much less specific picture. So oftentimes you may see abnormal posturing, which as you see here is just sort of gathering up to protect the stomach, self-injury to the abdomen, or also to other areas because of that poor sensory localization, aggressive behavior, vocal tics, cognitive or social regression, like I talked about, with that patient I saw Matthew several years ago, sleep disturbance, and also pica, or eat the eating of unusual things. A study that we've conducted along with Massachusetts General Hospital showed that GI problems were significantly associated with specific behaviors in autism, including on the more problematic end, self-injury, aggression, but also vocal tics, and these sort of subtle behaviors such as disturbance in sleep, mood, and appetite, as well as chapping on the chest or pointing to the abdomen. So in these next two, uh, next two uh, or next couple of slides, I'm going to show two patients, one of whom I received from a close collaborator, Tim Bowie, and another of a patient I saw, who presented with problematic GI problems, but who really didn't show when you examine them or presented with their history that a GI problem was evident. So the first patient is an eight-year-old who came in with biting, as you can see, on the side of her wrist and her hands. So really just purely self-injurious behaviors. And, you know, I've learned when I trained under Dr. Bowie that, you know, that self-injurious behaviors and aggression are not necessarily a part of autism and can be a sign of distress or pain. So this kid was scoped or had an endoscopy. And what you can see is when you see a normal esophagus, you can see that it's pink, it has nice vessels coursing through it. And what you can see is more like what we would have seen in a patient like the one I just showed you. The esophagus is very red, inflamed, and has these inflammatory nodules. So when this patient was treated for esophagitis, her self-injurious behaviors improved drastically within a month to two months of treatment. The next patient is a patient that I saw about, about a year ago, who's an 18-year-old female, and other than autism, had no other evident medical problems. 
She came to me with a six-month history of new-onset constant mouthing, and you can see there that she has her hands in her mouth, and that was something that never stopped. Self-injury, aggression, and a very limited diet due to texture aversion. She had had none of these symptoms before. So what you can see is if you look at her knuckles, again, a sign of the self-injury that she was punching walls and also biting her knuckles consistently. So again, because I saw all of these signs that I thought could be consistent with a GI condition, we scoped her. And what we found was something called a bezoar, which is a foreign object in the stomach. So she had swallowed a glove probably sometime around six months prior that had been filled with food and was probably intermittently blocking her stomach and causing her really significant distress. So the good news is we found it. The bad news was that it had to be surgically removed, but this is a picture of her after, and just you can see the smile on her face, and when you look at her knuckles, you can see that that self-injurious behavior, as well as the other symptoms she presented with, had completely resolved. So for the clinical part of my talk, I just want to summarize some of the major points that I went over. That gastrointestinal problems are common in individuals with autism, but the presentations of gastrointestinal pain are often nonspecific. So it's really important to diagnose and treat the GI problems effectively, not only because they cause these children distress, but because they really can cause these very difficult behaviors that can lead to other consequences down the line. And what I found is that treatments in general just don't tend to be as effective, either for the GI symptoms or for complete resolution of the behaviors. So based on that, I thought could determine of the etiology of a brain gut link in autism lead to the creation of more, more effective and or holistic therapies that might not only treat the gut, but may treat the autism associated behaviors as well. In other words, we had to figure out how are gastrointestinal problems related to autism spectrum disorders. So this was a nice review written a couple of years ago, which talks about what the potential brain-gut links are in autism that have been researched in depth thus far. And there are three major components, two of which I'm really going to talk about in a little more detail today. There's first the bacterial molecules in the gut, or the intestinal microbiome. So not only the microbiome itself, but also the different types of metabolites or neurotransmitters they produce or impact. And amongst those, serotonin seems to be one of the main main characters involved. I'm going to talk about these two features and then also talk about how the intestinal bacteria and serotonin may interact with the immune system also to facilitate brain-gut communication in autism. So I'm going to start with the intestinal microbiome which is a complex community, mainly consisting of bacteria, but also as research is increasingly revealing viruses and yeast. And so not only is the intestinal microbiome huge, it consists of trillions of cells, more cells than what make up our entire human body put together, but it's also extremely important and has been found to carry out a variety of really critical functions necessary for survival, including amongst others, metabolism and protection by things like stimulation of the immune system. But what we've also found is that the intestinal microbiota plays chief roles in gut-brain access communication and specifically may influence the brain and behavior by either altering secretion of neurotransmitters, which can cause different brain effects, and also leading to alterations in moods such as stress and anxiety, which often affect kids with autism, as well as behaviors, including autism-associated behaviors. So there's been uh, some data thus far looking or evaluating whether the microbiome might play a role in autism spectrum disorders. And so, you know, a lot of kids that have come to my office have come in with parents asking either, you know, will antibiotics help my child because either I've given my child antibiotics and they've gotten better or they've had an infection and when I give them antibiotics, their cognition or their speech gets much better. And so, you know, this all relates back to a theory about autism and clostridia, which interestingly was not developed by a physician or a scientist, but by a really smart mom of a kid with autism. And this is a picture of that mom, Ellen Bolt, and her son. So Ellen Bolt's son developed autism late onset after he received antibiotics for an ear infection. He developed behavioral regression as well as diarrhea which we often see in late onset autism. Based on this, she went through the literature and produced a theory that toxin-producing bacteria are responsible for autism-associated behaviors. 
She came up with Clostridia for several reasons. The first is that it does produce a toxin and that mice, when injected, injected with this toxin, exhibit features of late onset autism, including autism-associated behaviors and diarrhea. And further, there had been shown both in mice, but also in human anecdotal reports, improvement after treatment with vancomycin or metronidazole, which are two antibiotics that really do target clostridia. So based on this data, uh, Ellen Bolt then went around to different doctors, really promoting her theory to see if she could find somebody who might conduct a study and look at this and see if treatment with an antibiotic for clostridia may really help treat autism. And she met Rob Sandler, who was at the University of Chicago at the time, and together they conducted this small clinical trial looking at the benefit of oral vancomycin treatment in late onset autism. So to be eligible for the trial, you had to have normal neurodevelopment until you were one to two years of age, and then develop regressive autism with diarrhea after receiving a course of antibiotics. Each of these patients received vancomycin for two weeks, and then were monitored for changes in the core symptoms associated with autism, including communication, socialization, and behavioral changes. And what you can see is that during treatment, there was this dramatic improvement. However, unfortunately, there were several limitations to the study. First off, the effects were relatively short-lived, and within several weeks after stopping the vancomycin, um, virtually all the kids returned to their baseline function. It was also an open-label study, meaning that these families could have been biased because of, the sub, because of the effects of placebo, and also it was a very small study, looking at only 11 children. However, what this did was it really opened up the idea that the intestine and the bacteria within the intestine or the intestinal microbiome may play a role in behaviors associated with autism, and further really stimulated an interest in the possible uh, benefit or harm of clostridia. So what you see here is something called a phylogenetic tree. And the only thing I really want you to gauge from this is to see that since that time of Ellen Bolt's hypothesis, there have been many studies looking at the microbiome in the stool of kids with autism. And what you can see here is that the, the results vary tremendously. And there are a lot of different reasons for this. Like the study with vancomycin, many of these studies were, that were done were extremely small. And you're bound to get very different results when you do small studies in a population as heterogeneous as those with autism. Further, the methodology used to conduct these studies differs also tremendously. What you can see, though, however, is when you focus on the studies looking at clostridia, there seem to be, at least in a good number of studies, both an increased abundance and diversity of clostridial species. So this is being looked at more closely, and we're going to come back to this towards the end of the talk when we're actually looking at studies in humans. So the other study I wanted to highlight was the first study that was done, not looking at the microbiome in the stool, but the microbiome actually in the intestine. So Brim Williams, who's at Columbia, did a study looking at the intestinal microbiome from biopsies taken from kids with autism and gastrointestinal problems and neurotypical children with gastrointestinal problems. And what he found in these biopsy specimens were distinct abnormalities in carbohydrate digestion and transport. Specifically, in the kids with autism, they saw lower levels of disaccharidases, which are responsible for breaking down complex carbohydrates in the gut, as well as defects in transporters that then can transport carbohydrates over the intestine into the blood. And what he further found was that the expression levels of both of these factors were associated with abnormalities in the microbiome and specifically in bacteroides and firmicutes. So based on these findings, he came up with the hypothesis that in a normally functioning intestine, that disaccharidases break down complex carbohydrates that then transporters can, be, can bring those broken down disaccharides or carb carbohydrates and put them into the blood leaving a normal amount of carbohydrates or a manageable load to enter the large intestine and to also ultimately be absorbed or be excreted in the stool. In patients with autism, however, the lack of disaccharidases leads to less of a breakdown of carbohydrates, and the lack of transporters leads to less carbohydrates being transported into the blood, 
As a result, there's an overabundance or an excessively large load of carbohydrates that then go into the large intestine, causing bloating, flatulence, and diarrhea. So what he supposed is maybe this could be a reason why some kids have a beneficial response to gluten-free diets. And so this study was good because it, it was beginning to suggest potential functions for the microbiome and was also really looking at the intestinal environment because it was looking at biopsies as opposed to stool. However, it was a small study, like all the other studies done, and so really needs to be repeated in larger groups before we can make any sort of de definitive conclusions about what these relationships may be. The other question that I've been getting um, really increasingly in the last couple of years is, will fecal transplant help my child? And so there's been one study that came out from a group in Arizona uh, early this year. And what they did was they took 18 children with autism and gave them microbiota transplants, either orally through high dose pills or through colonoscopy. Each child, once they got the large dose, took normal doses of the microbiota every day for an eight-week period. And what they did in these children was measured gastrointestinal symptoms as well as autism behavior scales. And what they found, and you can see this by these bars progressively going down, is that there was a reduction or a significant reduction in both gastrointestinal symptoms as well as autism-associated behaviors uh, continuing throughout the time that these children took the, the microbiota. What they also saw was an overall increase in bacterial diversity, which is known to be a very good thing, and an increase in the abundance of three specific bacteria that have been found in some studies to be lacking in individuals with autism, including Bifidobacter, Provitella, and Desulfovibrio. What also the study showed was in the follow-up period, which occurred eight weeks after the children stopped the microbiota transplant, that the positive change in symptoms persisted. So these kids continued to have very low levels of both gastrointestinal symptoms as well as maintaining that decrease in autism-associated behaviors. So as I said, this was a, you know, a very small study. It was also open label and was really to look at the overall safety of the fecal microbiota transplant rather than actually the efficacy. But we, I do know that there is a placebo-controlled study currently being planned for this. So then I thought we'd go into why serotonin may be looked at as a brain gut link in autism. And I'm not going to talk at length about it, but there have been significant bidirectional interactions seen between serotonin and the intestinal microbiota. It's also well known that not only does serotonin impact the microbiota and vice versa, but serotonin is located chiefly in both the brain and the gut of human beings, with the vast majority, 95% of serotonin present or being made in the intestine where the microbiota reside. Further, what we and others have found is that serotonin does play critical roles in both brain and gut development and long-term function. In terms of autism, we decided to focus specifically on the serotonin reuptake transporter, which I'm going to abbreviate throughout this presentation as CERT. CERT is critical for modulating serotonin balance in the body as it transports and ultimately inactivates serotonin. And in human studies, there's been a variety of CERT-related variants that have been overexpressed in kids with autism. So the question that we examined was whether CERT dysfunction is a cause of both brain and gut abnormalities in autism. And we teamed up with two scientists, Randy Blakely, who's at Florida Atlantic, and Jeremy Veenstra Vanderweel, who's at Columbia, to, who did a genome-wide association study for CERT-associated genetic abnormalities in autism. Several coding variants of CERT were identified as risk factors in children with autism, all resulting in less available serotonin. So what Jeremy and Randy did was they took the most common coding variant found in this study of humans and put this knock-in mutation into a mouse, which they termed the CERT ALA56 mouse. So the CERT ALA56 transgenic mouse expresses the most common gain-of-function CERT coding variant in children with autism. And what they found was that these mice that had this mutation had core autism-related behavioral abnormalities, including alterations in social function and communication, as well as repetitive behaviors. Interestingly, they also had high blood serotonin levels, 
and 30% of individuals with autism have hyperserotonemia, and we don't really understand why or what that leads to. Further, they had altered serotonin-related brain abnormalities. So what we did was using this mouse, form the hypothesis that genetic abnormalities in the serotonin transporter, or CERT, of the kind found in autism also cause abnormalities in gut development and function. In other words, could the CERT ALA56 mutation be a brain-gut link in autism spectrum disorders? So what we did was we went on to look at the intestine. And what you're looking at here is actually a microscopic view of the enteric nervous system. So remember, that nervous system that resides inside the intestine. And in green, those little dots are all nerve cells within the gut. And if you look at that, you can see in the normal mice, there's a large amount of nerve cells, while in the cert ala 56 mice, there are significantly less, showing that gastrointestinal nerve cells were deficient in the cert ala 56 six mice. And what this translated into were defects in gastrointestinal speed. And what you're looking at here are some scientific graphs, which really look at total gastrointestinal transit, colonic motility, gastric emptying, and small intestinal transit. And what you can see is that three out of these four parameters were significantly slower in the CERT ALA56 mice. And I just wanted to focus on motility, which as you can see, is also significantly slower in the cert 56 mice compared to wild type. And what this means is that these mice were constipated. And as I said earlier, constipation seems to be the most common GI problem that we see in autism. So we then went on to actually look at something called peristalsis. And what peristalsis is are the most effective contractions in the gut that allow for propulsion of the stool. And you can see that here. So without effective peristalsis or peristaltic contractions, constipation can often result. And so we have a method by which we can measure these peristaltic contractions. And if you look at the wild type or the normal mouse, you can see that within a designated time period, there were seven different contractions. And they were all fairly long, taking up most of the screen horizontally. In contrast, when you look at the CERT ALA56 mouse, you can see only three contractions, and they're very short, really showing that colonic motility was slower and that peristaltic contractions were really less abundant and less effective in the Cerdalis 56 mice compared to wild type. So this is likely the reason why these mice are so constipated. We then went on to look at intestinal bacteria, and you can see here that under electromicroscopy in the small intestine, there's a huge amount of bacteria compared to what should be there normally. And when you compare the small intestine to the colon, usually the colon or the large intestine has much more bacteria than the small intestine. And we saw the opposite here, really showing that the, the mice with this mutation also have small bowel bacterial overgrowth, another condition that affects kids with autism. We also found, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit later, differences in the microbiome that mimic those seen in patients with autism. So then we went on to determine whether we could actually bypass the effects of this mutation during development to prevent all the defects we had seen in both the enteric nervous system development as well as gastrointestinal motility or gastrointestinal speed. And if you remember, the cert 56 mice have less serotonin signaling, which leads to less gastrointestinal neurons and slower gastrointestinal speed. We and others have found that stimulating the serotonin-4 receptor, which I have abbreviated here as the 5-HT4 receptor, both increases neuron development in the gastrointestinal tract and increases gastrointestinal speed. So really thwarting what the abnormalities would be in the cert 56 mice. So because of this, we decided to look at procalipride, which selectively stimulates the serotonin-4 receptor. And to answer the question, can serotonin-4 receptor stimulation or agonism alter both enteric nervous system development and gastrointestinal motility in the cert ALA56 mice? So we gave both the cert ALA56 mice and wild-type mice, which are the normal mice, procalipride or water, orally, daily, during both pregnancy and breastfeeding. Once the pups were weaned from the mother, we gave them no procalipride for three to five weeks to make sure that they had no acute drug effects. 
And then we looked at both in the procalipride exposed and the control pups, so the pups that didn't receive procalipride, were both examined at six to eight weeks for gastrointestinal nervous system development, gastrointestinal speed, and again, those peristaltic contractions that we talked about earlier. And what we found was that procalipride rescued both the gut nervous system and corrected the gastrointestinal motility defects in the CERT ALA56 mice. The numbers of intestinal neurons were normalized, and what this led to was a normalization of colonic motility, so the mice were no longer constipated, as well as a normalization of these peristaltic contractions, so the contractions used to push stool through the colon were completely normalized. What we also found was that procalipride prevented some abnormalities in the intestinal microbiome. And what you can see in the graph on your left is different bacterial communities in each group of mice. And you can see in the CERT ALA56 mice alone in yellow, their colony was extremely different from the one in red, which are the wild type or the normal mice. However, when the CERT ALA56 mice received procalipride, as you can see in blue, the microbiome was significantly more overlapping with the normal or wild type mice. And this is shown again in the overlapping circles on your right. What we're now doing is seeing whether the normalization of both the gut and the microbiome leads to a normalization in brain development and behavior. So in order to put together, you know, the three things that we talked about in that review of how research has really pushed towards this link between immunity, serotonin, and the microbiome, there have been two major studies that have really been pushing us towards what those links may be. And I'm going to talk about those in the next next couple of slides. So there's been many links made between autism and the immune system. And while I only put three references here, what I've done is highlight some of the reviews that go over a number of these. But that's a, that's a completely different topic, which could take up several additional webinars. What I'm going to focus on specifically today are prenatal infections. Um, because not only have prenatal infections potentially significantly increased the autism risk in offspring in humans, but there's also been a very good rodent model that's been modeled after this called maternal immune activation, or MIA. And what that involves is prenatal administration of a viral mimetic poly-IC. And so the offspring of mothers who receive this virus during pregnancy are born, they often exhibit core autism-associated behaviors, brain pathology consistent with autism, brain defects associated, again, with that serotonin transporter, and how they manifest is dependent on specific immune cells that really focus on the Th17 or IL-17A response. So in order to evaluate how serotonin, the immune system, and the microbiome may all be connected to the gut-brain axis in autism, there's one mouse study and one human study that have begun to put, the, began to put this all together. So Elaine Sow in California looked at this maternal immune activation model in the mice and saw that in addition to those brain and behavioral abnormalities, that maternal immune activation also led to a gut microbiota imbalance. And this was driven primarily by alterations in bacterioides as well as clostridia, which we talked about earlier. What she further found was that this was associated with intestinal epithelial barrier abnormalities, and essentially that the gut was leakier than it was in the mice without this. She then found that this led to a leakage of gastrointestinal metabolites and an altered serum metabolome, which harbored increased amounts of something called 4-EPS, which is critical for communication, as well as increased levels of serotonin or metabolites associated with the serotonin pathway, including indole-pyruvate. And what this led to was detrimental or autism-associated effects on the brain and behavior. Dr. Sow went one step further, however, and said that bacterioides fragilis may be a treatment for both the brain and the gut anomalies in at least a subset of patients with autism. So she chose this for several reasons. The first is bacterioides fragilis has been shown in other studies to potentially be anti-inflammatory in both the brain and the gut. And it's been further found in several microbiome studies to be selectively depleted in patients with autism. So when Dr. Sow gave the bacterioides to the offspring that were the result of maternal immune activation, she found that their microbiota partially no normalized, particularly in the areas, again, of bacterioides and clostridia. 
This was associated with improved epithelial barrier integrity, meaning that the intestinal epithelial barrier was less permeable. There was a subsequent reduced leakage of gastrointestinal metabolites, including serotonin related again, and that metabolite involved in communication in mice for EPS. And this led to beneficial effects on brain and behavior. So these mice really had significantly reduced levels of autism associated behaviors, including stereotypy, communication defects, as well as deficits in social interaction. So the last study I'm gonna talk about that links these three different components of immunity, serotonin, and the microbiome was actually done in humans and was uh, spearheaded by Ruthann Luna and Kent Williams. Ruthann Luna is at Baylor. And what they did was they analyzed the blood and rectal biopsies of children with autism and gastrointestinal problems and compared it to neurotypical children with and without gastrointestinal problems. They correlated the gastrointestinal symptoms in each group with gut microbial communities, in cytokines, which are really mediators of the immune system, and serotonin, as well as serotonergic metabolites. And what they found first off was very interesting. What you see here is something called a principal component analysis, which again looks at these bacterial communities, both in the kids with autism and the neurotypical kids with and without GI problems. And what you can see is that the microbiome communities didn't depend at all on the gastrointestinal symptoms, but actually on whether the kids had autism or were neurotypical. You can see that the neurotypical kids had what looked like completely different microbial communities relative to those kids with autism. What they further found when looking at the specific communities is that there were distinct differences in the kids with autism and the neurotypical kids that again was related to different Clostridiale species. And further, there were a specific microbiome signature that correlated with those kids with autism who had GI problems and specifically had gastrointestinal pain. But what they did was take this one step further, and they were able to relate it and show that certain aspects of the microbiome in both of these groups correlated with mediators of inflammation or the immune response and or serotonin or serotonin metabolites. So this was the first study that really took what we call this multi-omics approach, where you're able to look at many different factors at once and begin to relate potential differences in the microbiome to gastrointestinal symptoms, to serotonin, and to the immune system. So what I've done today is I've really given a brief overview of what we know so far of what's happening in brain-gut access communication in autism, but we still have many directions to go. The first is, you know, when I, I've emphasized several times here that the studies that I've shown you are very small studies, which is, you know, the data can be very difficult to interpret given the heterogeneity of autism spectrum disorders. And what we really need are large-scale multi-center studies with standardized methodologies to be able to look at this as cleanly as possible. Autism Speaks funded a huge study several years ago that's actually headed up by Ruth Ann Luna, who's the first author in the last study I talked about. And I know that they've collected about 400 samples so far that they're beginning analysis on. So we should expect those results in the near future. We also need double-blind placebo-controlled studies. Um, there have been studies, including in autism, where when families are aware that they're getting a drug or not getting a drug, that they may actually interpret results as positive when they're not really positive. And so, of course, that concern lies with something like the fecal transplant study. As I've said, I know that they're going towards a double-blind placebo-controlled study, so I think we're all anxiously awaiting those results before we can really tell families whether fecal transplant plant benefits children or not. Finally, when I've talked about the microbiome, there's many intriguing associations here, and I've presented some of those today, but we really don't have functional studies. So we really need to understand the mechanisms by which the microbiome and or the metabolome affect autism, and really what's beneficial and what's not and what they do in isolation. And so studies are really hedging towards that in more recently. And also look and be able to just discern between the possible windows for treatment. So we know that there are a large number of kids that are born 
with autism or don't have a regressive form of autism. And so there's a good amount of research really going towards understanding interactions between the microbiome and brain and gut development. And that's a lot of what our laboratory focuses on. There's also, as I talked about with the vancomycin study, really a distinct subset of kids with regressive autism. And these kids may have different mechanisms involved. And so we're still trying to figure that out. Further, the largest population we have thus far are patients have, who have been, who have already been diagnosed with autism, and for we have no real strong effective therapies. And you know, the underlying neurobiology of autism still has to be discerned, and so we're really working on figuring out treatments that may really address the underlying neurobiology of the disorder. So not only can we treat during development, but also after patients have been diagnosed. And finally, and I put a quote up here from Thomas Edison because this is not a new concept and the autism community has been saying this for a long time and research is finally beginning to catch up with the idea that diet and the microbiome may really play a role in the care of these patients. And so there's virtually been no studies looking specifically at what gluten and casein-free diets do to the microbiome and how that may serve as a biomarker for treating specific subsets of kids who really benefit from these diets. Along those lines, research is also in its infancy and in looking at things like prebiotics for treating autism. So I hope I've given you a good overview today of both the clinical side and the scientific side of gastrointestinal conditions in autism. And I just wanted to mention a variety of my collaborators because research does not happen by itself. It happens in huge groups of people. And so most of the people here I've mentioned throughout this talk, um, and I'd also like to recognize my research support. So thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. We've got quite a few questions here. Um, one of the first questions is about frequency of certain bacteria. So this person's asking what the most frequent GI bacterial species is associated with autism. And I know you touched on that a bit, but is there a specific species that you see the most of, or is it a variety of them? Sure. You know, it's, it's, I mean, it's a good question, and it's, it's a question that may be answered when we see the first round of those results from the study that was sponsored by Autism Speaks and is looking at 400 children. The largest studies that we have looking at, at individuals with autism and the microbiota have a maximum of 30 to 40 patients. And so when you think about how heterogeneous this, the disorder is and how many different other conditions and different medications and different diets these kids are on, many of which can affect the microbiome, I think that it's very hard to be able to really interpret what's most important at this time. I know that when you're talking about, you know, the, I guess the other question to answer here is, is there a bacteria that is there in overwhelming amounts? that causes these negative symptoms, or do, do patients lack a certain bacteria or not have enough of a good bacteria? And that's also what the fecal transplant study was looking at. And what they showed was that, you know, there are these bacteria that patients lack, and that when we replenish them, they may act, we may actually be replenishing positive bacteria that result in good behavioral effects. Um, you know, the non-spore-forming bacteria and clostridium have been seen in a variety of studies, so I touched on that. But I think it's also going to be very difficult to pinpoint one specific bacteria because there are going to be millions, if not billions, of different types. And I think that we're going towards more of an era where we're going to be able to look at the stool and actually look at signatures that patients have and be able to figure out what to replace them with specifically based on the differences they have rather than on one that encompasses many people. Okay, the next question. Um, so these studies, are they primarily of children? Is there a difference between kids with autism and adults with autism regarding these symptoms? Is there research and treatment on that? Sure, it's another great question. You know, there's, so some of the studies, I guess I refer to children throughout because I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist, but there have been no studies that have looked at adults and children together. The studies have looked specifically only at children or only at adults and compared neurotypical individuals to individuals with autism. 
So we don't, and the results are so variable between the, each of the studies, even when looking at the same study, looking at studies in a, only adults and only children, that it's impossible for us yet to tell where the real differences may lie. Um, there is there's one study which actually showed differences in autism versus other neurodevelopmental issues. However, again, it's one study and small, so we still have a lot of work to do in both areas. Okay. Uh, this is a question about SSRI use associated with the serotonin link. So you and I have actually talked about this a bit offline. So does this theory relate to that? Does this idea that that's a big piece of it, how would you make decisions about using SSRIs related to this? Yeah, there's been, so there's there's a number of studies going on now which are looking for biomarkers in individuals to figure out how SSRIs impact specific subsets of patients with autism. The problem is that in some patients, adults and children, SSRIs work beautifully in treating anxiety and or depression in patients with autism. And as a result, will really help with autism associated behaviors. But there are some individuals who get acutely worse. And it's a big problem. And we don't know which patients at this point get better or worse with SSRIs. But those studies are ongoing. And I hope that we have that in the future, whether SSRIs impact the microbiome and how that affects brain gut access. We know that SSRIs in patients without autism affect the intestinal microbiome but it ha it's you know but whether that's affecting the brain gut access and behaviors is really it's I mean there's really been no studies looking at that and in fact the one study that actually looked at humans in that multiomics approach which I talked about that last study which linked serotonin to the immune system to the intestinal microbiome took out patients with SSRIs and that was they needed to do that to really look and see to make sure this wasn't a medication based effect but certainly serotonin will have an effect but again because it's because the disorders are so heterogeneous it's going to be really important to try to figure out biomarkers and a lot of the research that 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 I've been doing is really focusing on looking at those biomarkers and trying to figure out what high blood serotonin levels mean who's going to respond to SSRIs and what sort of features we see in patients that have high blood serotonin levels okay so the sleep issues that you described, when we look at it from the gut perspective, um, I, I had a question about melatonin's path in this pathway with serotonin. So you, can you talk a little bit about what the cause of sleep disruption is with GI or what the different causes might be? Yeah, there's, um, you know, I would like to say that we have research in that area with sleep and with melatonin, and there's there's obvious connections and links between the serotonin and melatonin pathways. They have not been explored at all in the gut. It's some place I would like to go and just have not had the time yet to do it. Um, but we know that, I mean, the only thing that we know, and it's not really relating directly to serotonin, is that that GI problems really do impair sleep and that there's this real connection seen between sleep problems and GI problems. What we also know is that when you look at subsets of kids with autism, so when you look at these big data studies, which put kids into different subgroups in terms of what types of comor medical comorbidities they may have, GI and sleep are persistently connected. So I don't doubt that there is a connection. There just hasn't been a lot of work done in this area yet. Okay, asking about uh, fecal transplant. So is the only way to have a fecal transplant to participate in this study, or are there medical facilities where this happens? Do you know the answer? Yep. So, right. So right now, the uh, the FDA has only approved fecal transplant for recurrent uh, recurrent infections with a bacteria called Clostridium difficile. So if you don't have that outside of a study, you cannot get treatment with fecal transplant. And there's there's 
there's reasonable reasons for it, you know, and this is what I tell families who come to me and ask for it is that we don't, you know, like I've said, we don't understand the implications of bacteria and what specific bacteria do to brain gut or to the immune system or to various other aspects of the body and, you know, physiologic homeostasis. And so, I think, you know, once this placebo-controlled study is done, I think that maybe we'll have a better idea of whether this works or not. But I, I've recommended, you know, I have, I, I'm not going to give ideas of how people can do this, but certainly there are families who have done certain things in their own way and gotten fecal transplants in, in ways that are not not in ways that I would recommend. And what I tell those families is that at this point, because we've seen bad outcomes of fecal transplants, especially in certain kids with inflammatory bowel disease and the like, and we don't know the effects, that you shouldn't get it unless you're under the care of a physician and approved to do it. And so right now, the only way to do it is to go into this placebo-controlled study in Arizona. Okay. So does naltrexone therapy affect serotonin? Um, is there a connection between that treatment and that pathway? So that's a hard question. There's no, it's not, naltrexone focuses more on opioids um, and serotonin is they they have there's a lot of differences between naltrexone and serotonin so there hasn't been any connection that i that has been made between those pathways nor therapy that has been geared towards that that's serotonin related at least that i'm aware of okay this person's asking about um, diuretics for constipation. So are there nutritional approaches that you recommend if someone's looking for, for uh, support in that way? Or do they need to consult with a physician to learn more about the, the best way to do that? Sure. I mean, I think... You know, it's, you know, it's right. I think for, for mild constipation that has been relatively short-lived, that's certainly the the recommendations that I would give to any parent um, who has, you know, a, a child without autism would apply to kids with autism if you can get them to do it. So, you know, drinking a lot of water, you know, 64 ounces a day for a normal sized child is always recommended, particularly in the summer when it gets hot and kids tend to get more dehydrated or adults. Um, and high fiber diet that, you know, the average American gets about 11 grams of fiber a day when you need something like 25 to 35 grams a day. So high fiber foods, a lot of fruit, a lot of vegetables, fiber, there are healthy fiber supplements like Metamucil or FiberCon, which can also be used to supplement those things. Um, Small amounts of juices, you know, we say for babies, we don't give any, but for, you know, kids to have up to four ounces a day of pulpy juices like mango juice, pear juice, prune juice, those can all help as well. Um, the reason that I think, one of the reasons I think it can be so difficult in the in the autism community to treat these kids is because many of them don't want to eat high fiber foods or follow these sorts of rules. And it's a lot harder to get kids to comply with them. But certainly you can do that without seeing a doctor. Okay. We just have time for a couple more, but the first one here is about testing for clostridia. So what kind of test would, would you do if you were going to try to determine if that was present? Right. You know, I, I probably, you know, and this is where, you know, I get what I didn't show in this talk, but sometimes when I give talks, what I show are those stool tests that can be gotten at these random laboratories online. I don't recommend them at this point um, because clostridia has not definitively been shown to cause autism associated behaviors. And even if you look, when you, if you find it, we don't really know what to do with it because if you look at the study with vancomycin, it was a very short-lived effect that kids went back to baseline and some kids even got worse afterwards. Um, taking into consideration the idea of multi-drug resistance and the side effects of antibiotics, I wouldn't look at this point for what your, your microbiome makeup is because we just don't have enough information. It's 
what I alluded to is that we have a lot of associations. So we see maybe clostridia is an issue. Maybe clostridia plays a role. What kids or what adults it plays a role in? Could it be helpful in some people and harmful in others? We don't have enough information in terms of the function of these bacteria to really figure out where we go with it. What I also don't elaborate on is that clostridia, there are many different types. Um, and so there are some that may be good, some that may be bad. Some of these tests don't look at all of that. So there are many, many issues at this point in time with looking to diagnose clostridia and get it treated. And so I think that the, the benefits are not, don't yet outweigh the risks to checking for it and getting tested. So I think that what I highlight in it is that there's data supporting that we should do more research on it. But I don't think we're at the point where we should be treating this. Sure. Okay. Right. They're asking if there might be any potential connections between cerebral folate deficiency in children with autism. So you may be familiar with that research and if that there would be any connections with some of your work on the GI. <laughs> Sure. So you're, I mean, I think they're talking about the, uh, the genetic, the genetic mutation. Um, so yeah, I, there's been no connection made to that at this point. Um, you know, the, the question, you know, and I think that it's a, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because I think the significance of what that mutation holds has not necessarily been fully elucidated yet. And at this point, we have not yet seen a definitive gut link with the cerebral folate deficiency and with GI dysfunction. And so I think more research has to be done looking into that before we can go through that. And unfortunately, my research has not focused on that, at least up until this point.